It was the summer of 1980, and I was 21 years old. I had just graduated from the Harvard of the Midwest, the University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire, and I didn't know what to do with my life. My friends, it seemed like they were all getting married and headed off to exotic places for their first job, places like Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and Johnson Controls. And looking back on that last year of college, I realized over the years I was vaguely depressed, not clinically. I kept slogging forward as a Dutchman and a Scandinavian, and I wasn't talking to anybody, which, by the way, I've realized as the years have gone by is not the, um, the best way to go forward when you're in a season in your life. And um, if you need somebody to talk to, I, I hope that you know that I'm there for you. Uh, I, was, uh, I was lacking, I realized, uh, two simple ingredients to uh, we, what we understand today as a freedom of a Christian, uh, relationships and purpose. I, um, I got a job that summer at a Lutheran outward bound camp called Wilderness Canoe Base up in the boundary waters of Minnesota. You can see the maps and uh, such that we would use to guide um, groups into the wilderness all summer long, uh, groups from reform schools and uh, from treatment centers and also some Lutheran church groups. And uh, I was becoming a guide counselor. I arrived in late May and uh, that camp was kind of a, like a petri dish for people like me. There were 60 of us between the ages mostly 18 to 24, and um, a lot of us not sure what the next step was in life. We spent about a month in staff training, learning what was necessary to uh, not get people lost and to survive out in the wilderness. Uh, that was a big learning curve for someone like me who had only camped in the backyard, had never been in a canoe. But an even uh, more profound learning opportunity was spiritually, and that began every day during that month of staff training at 6.30 a.m. where the 60 of us would paddle or trudge in a covenant of silence to uh, the chapel in the pines that was there for a uh, first word. It would take some 20 minutes for some of us to take that silent trip every morning, and then we'd sit in silence until one of us who was appointed for the day would stand and, and share a scripture, a short reflection, a prayer, and then we'd sit in silence some more, a first word from God. Each day would end the same way. At mealtime in the evening, we would have last word. We spent time as a, a staff that summer uh, together each day, bathed in the light, connected to each other and to God. We read Dietrich Bonhoeffer's life together during staff training. And then in small groups, we would break out and discuss it most every day, a, a small portion of that profound text. And we realized, I realized where Dietrich Bonhoeffer found the courage to stand up to Hitler. Though so many in the Lutheran church in Germany in the time of World War II were co-opted into the Lutheran Reichschurch of Hitler, uh, Bonhoeffer demonstrated where the courage comes from to stand up when national leaders would, would lead the Christian church into a twisted agenda. I, I realized, looking back, that in those weeks, my, uh, my spirit was being formed, and I was yearning for, for those kinds of relationships, um, brothers and sisters that lived for a purpose, uh, lived for something more than just a long life, but uh, of meaning and value in relationship and the purposes of God. By late June, um, a steady stream of groups began to arrive, and I, and I began to guide my trips, kids from uh, the Rosecrans Treatment Center in northern Illinois, kids from the Bar Nun Boys Ranch in Kansas City, and, and from all points in Minnesota, Lutheran church groups. I spent some 68 nights out on trails the rest of the summer, and at the end of every trip, myself and the other 40 guides, whenever our trips ended, we would peel the 
clothes off our back and stuff them into a sack and bring them to that point in the forest there at the base camp where we found Deb, the laundry lady, who took our bags of laundry and, and washed them and folded them, and we'd return the next day, and there they were, and we'd take our next trip. And I remember just marveling at uh, what she did for us all summer long. Well, welcome, everyone. As, uh, as we take this third uh, stop in our Freedom of Christians series, we're thinking about simplicity and finding the way of God in relationships and in purpose. I didn't have a, a clue hardly when I was 21 years old of what that freedom of a Christian was like. How about you? How about now? How are we doing? I know that my life is a work in progress, that uh, finding that way is what God wants for us, and we, we pray for that today. I want to especially welcome those that are worshiping online. Uh, you know, today we have started that outdoor opportunity for those that want it, but we want to make sure that everyone knows that worship continues to be available online and will continue. We think forever, technology permitting, we'll always have the opportunity to be able to worship online, and we should be assured that wherever we are right now, that we are together in Christ. It is so good to be the church with you and to share this message. I'm so glad to be able to share with you a simple message of Christian freedom and simplicity. Yes, as I say, I had little sense of what that meant when I was 21 years old. I had a lot to learn about uh, learning to rely upon God and to be able to think about what it meant to dwell deeply in Christ. I still do. This scripture in Philippians comes to mind that God will supply our every need according to the riches of his glory. Coming to a place in life where we discover uh, that we can trust God to provide, it often comes out of a time of transition, a crossroads in our life that can happen, happen as young as uh, when we're emerging from our teen years into adulthood. And it can happen in seasons like COVID-19 where all of our plans, all of our dreams seem to be reevaluated, rearranged. We might like to live as though we can just go forward as though nothing really profoundly is happening. But, but, but God always sees these moments as an opportunity for us to grow spiritually, for us to realize that we can learn to trust in Him. As I make phone calls to members of the church and check on people, I'm discovering that, that this is a profound season of reflection. Yes, many are, are, are busy as can be, but, but in a different way. So many, uh, we're so grateful that, that most of us seem to be able to keep working. We're spared that, that, that great stress and strain of seeing our livelihood, at least to this point, being threatened. But unless uh, we are uh, uh, the essential workers, the, the health care heroes, and the law enforcement heroes who are continuing in, in life in, in, in even more intensity in this season, many of us have shared how it's different. It's even a bit quieter. It's even a bit slower. And it's an opportunity to think and reflect about what is our life for? What are the keys to living the freedom that Christ wills for us. We think about a scripture like um, Romans 8, 28. If you can flip for that one for me. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. We see a scripture like that and we might flippantly think, well, you know, if I just love God and, um, and, uh, and, and keep my faith in order, then all the good things are going to keep coming to me. But that's not really what the scripture says in its entirety. If you look carefully, according to those uh, called according to God's purpose, all things work for good. That reminds us that even in a season of strain, God's purposes are at work. It's essential for us to see these, these truths. How else could something like the cross of Jesus Christ work in God's scheme of things? How else could we find our way forward as people of faith in the midst of the burdens that we bear in this life 
that for those of us called according to God's purposes, we see how God works in all things for good. All things work for good for those that love God who are called according to his purposes. This crisis is an opportunity for us to rethink, to reevaluate, to maybe make some changes. We've thought in our lives that the key to life it might be to accrue and accumulate and to possess things. But God reminds us that what's most important is our relationships, our relationships with him, our relationships with our our spouse, with our children, with our grandchildren, with our families, with the human race. God reminds us that, um, that these are the keys and in living out of this relationship, we find our best purposes in life. I want us for a moment in the midst of whatever the anxieties are of this day to stop and take a deep breath to receive that uh, blessing of God which is a clarity of our relationship with him, his grace and his love assured for us right now and us being drawn into relationships that matter and lives of purpose and to dwell there, uh, to let that be the center of our life. It's so easy to lose track. We might find ourselves in this season wondering about all these young people, all of the all of the news reports about the young people and their gathering and their partying and at the beach and we wonder how can this be but some of us remember what it was like to be young and to be hungering for relationships and purpose we can appreciate how hard this season must be especially on them how does one find the keys well god would have us return to remember that uh, god is the first word and God is the last word, and to learn to dwell in his presence at whatever stage in life we are. Well, after guiding about the fifth of my eight trips that summer, I was pretty tired. Now, in those days, my recovery time was not what it is now. Uh, is there anybody out there hearing me? A recovery time as you get older is not what it used to be. Um, I remember being very tired and uh, in fact uh, one evening uh, a dear guide friend, I just wanted to spend time, I knew I had a trip coming up real quick again but I wanted to stay up late and spend some time with some some friends and and this friend looked at me and he just said, Greg, your body exudes fatigue. Well, that very day, the uh, camp director had asked me uh, to stop and talk with him. And he said, you know, I know you've had a lot of trips, but we just had something coming up, and I really need your help. We've got a group coming from Minneapolis. It's a MARC group. Uh, We wouldn't use that acronym today. This was 1980. MARC, M-A-R-C, Minnesota Association for Retarded Citizens, were bringing up groups, and they had an extra group. And would I be willing to take them out for just a couple of nights? on a short trip. Uh, Whether he could see the fatigue in me or not, I am not sure, but that did not prevent him from piling on when he said, oh, and I'd like you to take with you uh, Deb. She's not been able to get off the base camp all summer long. (laughs) That's Deb, the laundry lady. Remember her? Do you remember Jesus' first miracle? we could go to the next slide, Um, at the wedding in Cana of Galilee, Jesus and the disciples and his mother Mary invited to a wedding banquet celebration. Jesus, um, many stories in the Bible help us picture the kingdom of God as a, a great wedding banquet celebration, our relationship with God through Jesus Christ as that of our, us being the bride and him being the groom, that, that wholehearted, uh, devotion. Uh, They're invited to a wedding, and when they are there, they find out they've run out of wine. And uh, they come to Jesus and the disciples and and say, we've run out of wine. (laughs) And um, Jesus looks at them and says, what does this have to do with me? My time has not yet come. Well, Mary happened to know something about Jesus and problems in life, just like any mom knows her son and daughter better than anyone else could, and she simply looked at the stewards of the feast and said, just do whatever he tells you. 
He told them to take the jars that were empty there, those jars that had been used for the Jewish rite of purification that had been filled and been emptied out and poured out to wash and to cleanse. And Jesus said, fill them again with water and then take some of that to the steward of the feast. And that's when it happened. The first miracle at Cana in Galilee in John chapter 2 when the water was turned into wine and they found out that there was enough and to spare and they wouldn't possibly run out. That's what it means in our relationship with God as we seek purpose out of our relationships in life. This COVID-19 crisis, like any crisis in our life, often thrusts us into a point where we become afraid and anxious. We begin to look at others to compete with others. Our lives are once again transformed into a a tendency to want to shame and blame and, and be frustrated and angry. These human tendencies that come out of our fear that somehow we're not going to have enough or we're not going to get for ourselves But out of our relationship with God, we find out there's enough and to spare. We find out our purpose that our time has come. Through Jesus Christ, we find out that our priorities need to be rearranged. We think that it's all about accumulating and possessing and having stuff. But God reminds us over and over in Scripture that you can fill yourself with stuff all you want, but no matter how full you fill yourself, you're going to be empty unless you're filled with your relationship with him and his purposes in our life. Well, the Mark group arrived, and let me tell you, it was no picnic from the very first moment. Questions were endless. They arrived at the... um, at the cove, our mainland, and uh, the tradition was that we would, would launch our experience as the ancient voyagers and jump into the Montreal canoes, the 25-foot canoes, and we would paddle together, which worked all well and good with youth groups at times, but uh, my job as the guide leading that big canoe from the, island, from the mainland to the island where we would start our orientations was to get us to paddle together. And of course, that didn't work so well, and the paddles clanking together and... Uh, the, the Mark group finding out that if they were going along, they could splash really well, and they could especially splash me. It took us forever to, to go about 100 yards <laughs> to get to the island where we would start orientations, and along the way, every question, are there sharks out here? How deep is this lake? And endless pauses along the way. One of them... One of the group I uh, took to privately calling Wild Bill. Um, he, he wore a uh, crash helmet, and um, it was actually a bike helmet that he never took off until nighttime, but life had dealt him a difficult blow in addition to the challenges of, of, of his capabilities. His balance was out of whack, and if you've been in the Boundary Waters, you know that every path is simply filled with rocks and roots, those shallow-rooted black spruce trees that are coming up everywhere around and blown over by the windstorms. Um, it was a hazard to simply walk anywhere and Bill you know, on flat surfaces constantly falling. And every time he would fall along the path, his head would be protected by the bike helmet and he would swear oaths. I'm going to sue Woody, the red-headed woodpecker. He was talking about me, his guide. It was out on our trip that um, Bill's life disclosed a deeper struggle that he faced regularly and that was that during the night, after we had found a campsite, after we'd managed to collapse into our tents. I'd cooked a meal, and I'm sure that this super guide didn't have a last word that night. <laughs> I, we collapsed into our tents and slept, and I woke up in the morning with the reality that Bill, who was sleeping next to me, had completely soiled his sleeping bag. And in the early morning mist, I crawled out, and I walked down to the lake, and I just sat feeling sorry for myself for For a good hour, I sat there wondering what life, (laughs) my life was becoming. Finally, I 
looked back as I heard the stirrings in the tents behind me, and I, I saw that uh, Deb, the laundry lady, had things under control. She'd coached, coaxed Bill out of his sleeping bag. I saw him, her give him a hug. I saw her help him into clean clothes. I saw her take his sleeping bag down to the lake and wash it out. You know, whatever we mark as our path along the way, finding our our life uh, in its meaning in the way of Jesus Christ, God wants us to discover it in simplicity, in relationships, and in purpose. We are wise to see the person of Jesus Christ in our lives as uh, the one who was a very simple person, by any measure, poor by material standards in the world, who bound himself in relationship with marginalized people and who invites us into an eternal relationship with him in the world, this way of simplicity, this way of the freedom of a Christian.